Sunil has done some very interesting work on the philanthropic side, but I want him to kind of expand on what's happening between U.S. and India in those terms. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Amar. <clears throat> I'm going to come at a slightly different perspective from everything you've heard thus far, but I'll build a little bit, Nina, on what you just said. Uh, not that I expect to be Mr. America or anything <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, but here's the thing. We've all talked about, and we all know, you know how successful Indian Americans have been in the US. And as Ashley very nicely pointed out, it's not just the Indians who've come here and been successful, it's the US that's helped to make us successful. But the other really common factor that we often lose sight of is the fact that all of us have been extremely fortunate in life, right? We've been very lucky. Uh, most of us tended to grow up in middle class families in India. We were in families that were able to get us educated, send us to decent schools. After that, we were able to come to the US, study over here. That's a relatively small proportion of the people in India. And then here, we were able to start companies or join universities or become physicians, engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So we've been very fortunate. Uh, at the same time, you know, we grew up in India in the middle of poverty. I mean, I grew up in Delhi and Bombay. And uh, again, I was in a middle class family, but right around you, everywhere you look, are people living in slums. You go one hour outside Bombay or Delhi, there are these villages to this day with people living the way people did a thousand years ago, no access to water, electricity, healthcare, etc. Uh, you can get out from Bombay Airport today. I mean, it's a beautiful, shiny airport, but you go 10 minutes away and you've got these ugly slums with people living in these horrible conditions. So it comes up, if you've been this fortunate, how do you help? How do you help make life a little bit better for people who weren't as fortunate as you? Now, fortunately, Indians generally, Indians in India, but also Indians in the US are generous. People have been giving back for decades but it's been at a relatively small scale. The good news is over the last three to five years, I've seen a dramatic change in the kind of giving that's happening. So not only is the money, the amount of giving, the volume of giving increasing, and my guess, it's a guess, is that right now Indian Americans philanthropically are giving something like 100 million to 200 million dollars a year back to India, it's a good number. It's up dramatically from five or 10 years ago but it could be a whole lot more. Beyond the money, what I'm finding much more interesting is the following. People are taking the experiences that they've learned with over here and seeing how they can apply that know-how to improving the lives of citizens in India who are less fortunate. So as an example, technology entrepreneurs, and I'm a technology entrepreneur, <laughs> have experience with how to apply innovation to real world challenges and problems. They know how to scale up companies fairly quickly. And so they are providing not only money going back to India in education in livelihood and healthcare, et cetera, but they're saying, how can we help these NGOs in India grow at a scale at which they've never done before? And I think that really is the most dramatic change. And just as a tiny example of this, and I say this with all humility, I'll just share my own little personal story with you because I think it exemplifies some of this and I'll do this in less than one minute. Grew up in a middle-class family in Bombay, as I mentioned. Went to the II, one of the IITs. Came to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Got an MBA. Since then, I've started two or three different companies. The first one wasn't successful, unfortunately. The second worked out fairly well. Uh, I started this company with a friend of mine. We were called iGate Corporation. Uh, we went public many years ago. Uh, we grew to over 35,000 employees. We grew to over a billion dollars in revenue. And last year, we sold the company to a very large French company for about four and a half billion dollars. A few years before that, I started an NGO in India. I've had this personal interest in healthcare. Uh, and when you travel again outside Bombay and Delhi, et cetera, and you go to the villages, you see today how bad healthcare is. You can go one hour outside our capital of Delhi, and there are people you know, who have no access to healthcare. Uh, you, know, you have these rural clinics, typically run by the government. Half the time you go there, the doctor isn't there. The doctor's there, the medical equipment doesn't work. If the equipment works, there's no medicine out there. And these poor villagers who are typically earning less than a dollar a day, you lose an entire days of income. You know, if the wife is sick, the husband has to take her to this health clinic, and you go there again, doctor's not there, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite pathetic. So I said, is there some way to bring in some of this innovation that we hear about and that we've worked with 
and use that to help improve healthcare in India. So I started this little foundation about three years ago, uh, and our model was, and it's called the WISH Foundation, W-I-S-H, and the idea was how can we partner with government in India, with state governments, which is where healthcare is delivered, to provide good quality primary healthcare in remote areas. Uh, our focus is in the low-income states of North India, because that's where most of health, India's healthcare problems are focused. We started in the state of Rajasthan, did, did an analysis, met senior healthcare people in the state, and came up with a model on how we would bring innovation in to help these, look, these primary healthcare clinics get dramatically better. And innovation was in the form of low-cost, ultra-low-cost diagnostics, therapeutic devices, etc. But a lot of the innovation was in things like governance. How do we get doctors to show up? How do we get medical personnel to go out to these remote areas? How do we keep them over there? How do we make sure they're showing up every day? You know, the equipment works, etc. Cutting a long story short, uh, we've partnered with the Rajasthan government. We've partnered with the Delhi government. We're now running about 300 clinics, you know, uh, three years after getting started. We're treating about 300,000 patients a month. So, you know, about three and a half million uh, patients a year people who didn't have access to quality healthcare before. All of the uh, healthcare is provided totally free. The cost is shared between the government and my foundation. And now we have multiple other states interested in this model of how we can bring in innovation to improve healthcare. Just a tiny little example. I mean, I know other Indian Americans who have been doing this for much longer than me, who are doing things on a bigger scale than I am, whether it's in education and livelihood, my elder brother, Ramesh Wadwani, is doing a lot of big stuff in the area of livelihood skills training. Desh Deshpande, who you've probably heard of, is doing a lot. He started this midday, school, uh, midday meal program for school kids. They are now providing midday meals to over 2 million poor children every day. So there's a lot happening. So the point I'm making is that a lot of what we've learned over here can be applied to improving things for the underserved in India. We can never lose sight of that. Uh, as I mentioned, we are now up to maybe 100 or $200 million of in giving. My guess is that over the next five to 10 years, we will see that grow to over a billion dollars. So I think the impact we can have isn't just in our spheres of influence here in the US, but I think much more in the long term, it's what can we do to help India get better every day. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.